We got the call. Let's see if he gets. Hey, Annette. Hey, who do we have on the phone? Is that Freddie? Jeffrey. Oh! Welcome to the Wise Guy Show. <laughs> are you there? Hi, Jeff. And that's here, too. Where are you? I'm good. We're using her phone to do the phone interview call through the speakers. <laughs> oh, listen, I only talked to Annette on her phone. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Welcome back to the Wise Guy Show, Jeff. It's been a while. Yes. How was your trip in Europe? You looked like you were having a ball. I was having a blast. It, it was nice to uh, finally get caught up at show in Italy. I was supposed to do in May of 2020. And you know what happened with yes, COVID. Yes, they got yes. postponed once. They got postponed twice. They got postponed three times. I'm like, what the? Christ. So it got back online. And uh, just before the trip, I had nine teeth pulled. So Ooh. it was no, oh, no, way, no way I was going to eat uh, al dente pasta. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, but I had a lot of tiramisu and a lot of gelato. <laughs> awesome. Listen, uh, this is Jumpin' Gennaro. How you doing? Uh, we we changing the name. We don't want to hear tonight. that. How you doing? We don't like the name COVID. We don't want to hear that anymore. No. Yeah, yeah, so we, from now on, you're gonna instead of saying COVID, you say Cornudo. <laughs> All right? <laughs> yes, Godfather. Go like this. <laughs> Jeff, I'm so happy to have you. I, I apologize. A lot of the wise guys couldn't make Chiller Theater. We really wanted to do a little promo like we did at Horicon years ago when we first met you. But um, yeah. It was a great time. We're going to see you eventually. We really want to do dinner, hopefully, when you are back in our town area. Um, we also invited um, Donald Full of Love and uh, Johnny Green. If you are ever doing anything in town, we have a family restaurant over here, uh, a couple of them, and uh, we'd like to have you as, well as our guest one evening. I would love that. I know Don is going to be coming back to New Jersey like this coming weekend or Father's Day weekend with Claudia, Claudia Wells, you know, played Jennifer. Yes. Oh, he's you're doing something. Yeah, he's doing it in Phillipsburg. It's about an hour away. But we, we invited him. If he's around to, to let us know, we definitely will meet up with him. Well, I, I like to eat, so I appreciate the invite. Well, yeah, we do, too. We're gonna. <laughs> you're not only going to go from the, the past, the present, and the future. We're going to bring you back to Italy, okay, when you come in our family yeah. place, all right? <laughs> really? You, you make your own uh, cannolis or tiramisu? Uh, Every, that, everything's homemade. Let, wait, wait, wait. Let me explain to Jeff. Yeah. Jeff, this, this, it's like a village. He's got, uh, he's probably one of the very first uh, uh, wood burning stove pizzeria, wood fire, wood yeah. fire stone uh, pizzerias in our area. And then uh, right alongside it, he owns the bakery, oh. which is amazing. And it's then he has a Aroma soda. Aroma di Napoli. Yeah. So all the flavorings come from Naples. Yes, it's all. It's all. And then, yeah. and then if if you don't want that, we can go to Hoboken, New Jersey, Ooh, on the waterfront another, another at, a, at his other place. restaurant called Blue Eyes in in front Sinatra Park. I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you're welcome. You let us know when you're in town. That was just an invite because we invited Donald and uh, and Johnny. And uh, again, we would love to have you all as our guests. And uh, oh, by the way, they're good. They're good company. Yeah, we didn't let you know. This whole show is about food. We're not talking about anything. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> no, it's. Oh, uh, that's nice. I, I was uh, while I was in Italy. Uh, you know, I talked about food a lot. I couldn't eat so much, but I talked about food. I talked about my experience playing uh, Comedia dell'arte characters, you know, uh, from Napoli in particular, awesome. I play Puccinella Citrullo. Wow. And, and when, the, when the Italians heard that I, I play Comedia characters, they were beside themselves. They loved it. So I started doing physical comedy during my panel, uh, landing on my ass and, and uh, demonstrating, you know, Puccinella has got the big belly and the big, the tall sugar loaf hat and a hunchback. Yeah. And, wow. uh, He's revered there in Napoli because that's where he's from. And then Bologna, which was where near I was uh, there in Bellaria, uh, Il Dottore is from there. And so I, I got, I'm trying to get uh, a Commedia and food tour of Italy together. Oh, that's nice. nice. That's well, how about this one? I got a good one. In, a, in, an, in another year, I'm going to say not this year coming, not 
2023, but 2024, hopefully, I will have, I have a house in southern Italy. That's, we, we sleep, uh, I think, I think six bedrooms. I'll be able, we'll be able to f- sleep comfortably because I have other relatives there. But I mean, it's like, and we wanted to do a Wise Guy show live from, from Avellino, Italy. Ooh. And um, we, look, you're welcome to join us there too if you want to yeah. come on. <laughs> Just got to pay for the yeah, plane. Well, <laughs> If if uh, if I can afford it, I'll be there. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, let me ask you. Uh, so, is this jumping Janeiro again? You developed these characters while you. I know you did a lot of theater and uh, you studied in actually in uh, in California. Uh, uh, specifically, um, uh, you were in uh, San Francisco area, right? Is that where you developed some of these characters, or you, or is this through your journey of uh, of many many things that? You I- you know, so the many things in the early 70s, I started performing at the, the original Renaissance Fair. Wow. And uh, there were comedia characters there that I, I witnessed. And I was like, what's this all about? And I was fascinated. And I'd even jump on stage a few times. Then I started in Los Angeles, where I was raised, uh, working with a group called L.A. Del Arte as Arlequino. And uh, sometimes stepping into Capitano. And then uh, studied up at the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco uh, and continued working at fairs and different comedia troops. And uh, wow. like I said, you know, just doing um, whatever I can because it's a real, first of all, it's it's a theater, these, these characters and that theater was developed about 800 years ago right. in Italy in, as a protest to, uh, because the church pretty much uh, controlled theater. They wouldn't allow anything to go on in theater unless it was a morality play or a passion play about Christ's story. So the people had had several hundred years of that oppression and said, that's enough. And these characters came out of really the people wanting to see entertainment and parody like we do with stand-up comedy now of people in power. Right. And, right. and, uh, and, and fun. <laughs> And so, so, and, and, so you you mentioned, uh, of course, from Napoli. That's some of the greatest uh, artists, uh, and I'm sure you know Toto. You know, Toto was uh, the Charlie Chaplin of it, of, of Napoli, of Italy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And he but, did a lot of stuff. But with, here's one I want to bring to your attention that I did. I looked a little bit up your background, um, and there, uh, oh. apparently you play. I haven't seen it yet. Now that got me interested. Uh, you play a Groucho, a good Groucho. Yeah, uh, in 1987, in between television and movie gigs, I fell into playing Stanley Laurel of Laurel and Hardy at oh, Universal right. Studios in wow. Hollywood. Wow. And uh, they had a Charlie Chaplin there from Tunisia who really, he didn't, I mean, he, he his heart was into it, but his accuracy was way off. So to kind of up his game, I started playing Charlie uh, a la the Keystone era of uh, Charlie, and uh, it kind of got the first stringer to get his act together because he saw me coming up on his butt, mm. you know, uh, being more authentic. And he pulled his costume and his uh, act together more. About a year after starting to play Charlie, I started playing Groucho. And uh, I just, you know, can't do those characters half assed. Yeah. You can't do you the, right. the genius. Yeah, Stan Laurel, you know, he wrote and often directed and edited those Laurel and Hardy films he did with uh, the Hal Roach Studios. Charlie Chaplin, as we all know, wrote and directed, was a maniac, obsessive, and and uh, and Groucho was just a, a friggin' genius from a family of genius lads. And I, I, you know, throw all my research and everything I can physically. I'm not the, the highest or best trained but I'll, you know, dive in and and I'll sing his Groucho. I I'll send you a link of me performing yes, at Harris. I want to see it. New, I want to see it. You, you did a few. You did a few Groucho's. I looked up, but there was a couple productions you did as Groucho. Yeah, I'm in a couple movies. A terrible movie with with Les uh, Leslie Nielsen um, called uh, 2001: A Space Travesty. Oh. There's a cameo of me as as Groucho in that, and then I play Groucho at the Gates of Heaven. In uh, Rodney Dangerfield's last film and one of Frank Gorshin's last films called, uh, it was originally called Everything's George. It's now called 
angels with angles. I got another. See that. I got to see that. that. I got to change yeah, the I name of the movie. It's uh, angels with angles. Angels, angels with angles. I'll remember that. That's easy. And then if Frank Gorshin plays not only this Cuban assassin, but he also plays George Burns. Really? And his his makeup is George Burns. is uncanny. It looks like George Burns is there. And uh, the story loosely is that George has got to get a good deed on Earth so he can be reunited with Gracie Allen in heaven. <laughs> so, and Rodney Dangerfield plays God. Oh, and, you know, Rodney, <laughs> Rodney was kind of out of it. He had to read all his lines. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was kind of tough. But yeah. nonetheless... Yeah, I'm Groucho in that. And then I, you know, like I mentioned, this Harris gig where I sing Lydia the Tattooed Lady and do jokes and monologue. It's pretty good stuff. I couldn't send it your way or a net. Definitely, I'll send it to a net. Yeah, we want to see. Want so, like to so see. something I want to share with you. Uh, there's um, all of the original. Now you're talking about Charlie Chaplin. You were talking about, you know, Laurel and Hardy. You, you know, most of that was going on, believe it or not, on the East Coast, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania. And actually, I was born in Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and this place, second to Pittsburgh in the steel industry, uh, was actually the first home of Warner Brothers Studios before they went to California. So, and, oh, yeah. And Bob Hope had his first radio show before he went to uh, vaudeville. So there's a lot of, you know... Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, Ohio action on the East Coast besides New York. Oh, yeah. The, uh, New York was really the, the main filmmaking uh, center for early silence. And uh, Charlie, you know, worked for SNA Studios, which was out of Chicago. And uh, uh, then uh, a couple other uh, locations out in, out in the West. But, yeah, the uh, majority of the silent films like Oliver Hardy made were there on the East Coast. A lot of people don't realize that Hollywood was not Hollywood until probably well into the 1920s. So how did you how did you go into the future? Uh, yeah, the back to the back future. Back to the future. That's well, what no, I want well, to hear. I want, right. before, before that, I wanted to ask you, okay, now we obviously know the original Back to the Future you weren't in, but you did end up coming into playing part two and three to play George McFly. How was that transition? Yeah. That, was, that had to be a major... Um, uh, you know, uh, that had to be something difficult to to attempt because you were put, you're looking to play a character right. that isn't you. That was in the first one, and you have to be precise. And and you know, from what right. I've seen, you were. You know, but 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 that was uh that had to be something that that you know that had to be tough. Well, going back to the first film, um, before the first film came out in 1983. I did a film at the American Film Institute with Crispin Glover and uh, Dan O'Herlihy. And so I thought Crispin was an, a very, uh, very interesting actor. I, I wanted to uh, steal his beetle boots he was wearing. Uh, I, I thought his timing was really, uh, really singular. And I exchanged phone numbers and tried to stay in touch with him. So in 85, when Back to the Future came out, I was uh, co-starring in Pale Rider with Clint Eastwood. Yes, right. another great movie. And I wanted to see what the other films were that summer. And so, of course, I went to see Back to the Future, which was actually released twice that year. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was Crispin, and I was like, I know that guy. He's knocking it out of the park. And I called him up to congratulate him. And, and of course, I loved what Chris Lloyd, who I was a big fan of, and Mike, Mike Fox were, were doing. Um, and, you know, four years later, when I got a call from an agent say, asking if I knew who Crispin was, I was like, of course I do. You know, are you the same height, the same weight? And I said, no, he's taller. He's heavier than I am. What's going on? And he tells me that they're, they're looking for a photo double stand in for him on a film. And I said, on the sequel for Back to the Future? And he says, I'm not I'm not at liberty to say. And I said, get me in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll I'll be a stand-in for him just so I can make my medical because my my uh, wife was having our our second child and I needed my medical. Um, so slowly but surely, you know, I got fitted for prosthetics. I had a screen test in the young George makeup. Uh, I had auditioned. I met with the assistant directors and auditioned for uh, Dean Cundy, the cinematographer, and, and Bob Z, the Robert Zemeckis, the director. And I learned very slowly that. Crispin wasn't going to be coming back, which shocked me yeah. because he was so good. 
as George. I what was, was like, the, what was the real reason why he didn't come back? Do you know? I I, I may have known. Oh, there's that. there's a a lot of uh, some is urban legend now, but uh, I think it was the Crispin. You know, his star was rising. I think he held out as for more money than they were willing to pay him. Oh, okay. I think they offered him like a hundred thousand, maybe a hundred and a quarter, and I think he wanted a million because while back we were then, shooting, wow. Spielberg came up. Spielberg came up to me while we were shooting and said, so Crispin, I see you got your million dollars after all. And I was like, <laughs> what? The? And, and I, I was in this body cast to do the special effect. And I, I guess involuntarily uh, tried to kick him because I realized how much money I was saving him. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I didn't, didn't connect. I didn't kick Spielberg, but, <laughs> but the idea was there anyway. Uh, so he, he also has, has come out, wanted, uh, script approval, which I don't think uh, Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis were going to give him. And, uh, you know, it was really a shame because he, he should have, you know, been flexible, given in, because it was a part he really established beautifully, and he should have carried it on. Um, and, and also, you know, he was supposed to play Shameless in Back to the Future Part 3. Wow. This Jumper Gennaro again. So did you ever have any conversation about it with him ever or have you connected ever yeah since? he called me when when part three came out he called me saying you know what they did to me is unfair i said well what they do and they said well they they took a couple scenes of my work from the first film and they are only going to offer me like double scale for that usage i said that's not fair first of all the first film was the highest grossing film of 1985 and the sequels are going to you know make oodles of money and then he said you know and also that life mask makeup that the prosthetics that you wore i didn't get anything for that i I was like how is that possible how could they not pay you for the licensing of your life mask of your likeness they pay you know licensing for the use of stan laurel and charlie chapman and grouch remarks when i'm working at universal why aren't they paying you and he said i don't know so that's why he went after them to sue and he took my stories and he, you know, he got a settlement um, out of court for like three quarters of a million dollars. Mm. Wow. How about you wearing that stuff? I mean, I, I, I always wonder, you know, when actors have to wear it for a long period of time, does it start to get under your skin? Pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you, it, it was uh, not so comfortable. They, they didn't want you to eat the makeup artist. We had the best creme de la creme of makeup artists in Hollywood working on us and, you know, take four hours to get any of those three age makeups on the 17 year old George, the 47 year old George or the 77 year old George that I, I appeared in as four hours to put on. Wow. Then you work sometimes up to 20 some odd hours and then another hour to take it off. Oh boy! So they didn't want you to eat, you know, use a straw because the, the prosthetic at the edges of your mouth would crack <laughs> Um, they, you know, have to putty you in and touch you up, but, but nonetheless, you, kept, you know, it you, was a, you were able to keep cool during that without losing your mind. Yeah. Sometimes you get an itch and you can't scratch that itch. Under, <laughs> because you just like, you just tap it, you just tap it and, and pray that itch goes away. Yeah. Um, but I was thrilled to be working, you know, I was thrilled to be on that set with such great, fantastic talent that Zemeckis had assembled for the first film and, and to come back and be a, sort of like the adopted bastard son on this on these sequels, uh, and it was it was really great. And you know, at first people were like, "Oh wow, what is this?" You know, with the makeups. But then they realized, you know, it was the only way that they could get the film made and try to fool the public that you know everything looked the same since they had to recreate the scenes from the first film. And yeah, and you, so. Yeah. You had all the movement, though. You you duplicate his movements really well. I mean, uh, well, that's where the team. Commedia dell'arte, the physical training, comes in. Yeah. You know, I found where Crispin had his center of gravity, and when he walks, he kind of led with his forehead and had his hands out ahead of himself, and you know, his body weight was was carried hunched over a little bit. You know, his his characterization was really fantastic, and it was uh, he had not only the six or seven weeks shooting with Eric Stoltz to develop it, but he had many weeks uh, to develop in rehearsals with Leah and Tom. I have, when I got the part, they gave me a videotape of their makeup tests and stuff. And, and he was really working hard developing this, this character that, you know, had this weird kind of, kind of, you know, the, the wimpy George 
you know, floaty all over the place kind of thing, which I could use in advance on in part two when I was, you know, George hanging upside down. I'll tell you something I learned recently about why he was hanging upside down. You know, in the Ortholev in 2015. Yeah. So uh, apparently that's actually Kristen a famous shot, not, actually, if you see it. Yeah. And and uh, there was a, a railing, a rail from outside the front door through the living room and through that uh, living room or TV room and then through the kitchen um, that I was, you know, hanging from wires on and, and I was guided by a remote control. Oh, so wow. apparently Crispin would either undershoot or overshoot his marks for camera on the first film. So Bob and Bob decided, well, if we put him in this thing of the future where he's hanging upside down because he threw his back out, we can control him for the camera, and thus he'll hit his marks every time. Wow, wow. wow that's great. That's an amazing story. I, I, listen, I, I can hear your passion for acting. I can, I can hear you just by the way you speak, uh, how, how passionate you are about playing the role you want to play, and, and I, I applaud you for that because a lot of actors, uh, I know they have that that uh, mentality to do that, but it's the passion that is what makes him a better actor. How do we get uh, through this whole thing without doing a not so? Yeah, we gotta do my not so. Not so. Uno, due, tre, not so. But um, I, I want to ask you: Are you doing anything? Uh, are, you, are you doing anything? Um, uh, you know, recently yeah, that you want to mention? I'm uh, I'm talking to you guys. Yeah. No. <laughs> any 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 productions you're working on? Anything you could? Uh, any yeah, just, Anything you want to promote? I I just wrapped my principal photography on an indie film called Siblings, where I play the <laughs> the hedonistic head of a, a family of like five degenerate brothers and sisters, um, and and daddy. Uh, first, he has a stroke. I have a stroke during Thanksgiving dinner, and then when my girlfriend shows up, uh, my character has a heart attack, making love to her in the other room while they're fi <laughs> finishing up dinner. So they don't stroke know what to do with Daddy's back body. Back. And a lot. That's always good. How about any any websites or anything? Any uh, any um, uh, social media pages? Yeah people, yeah, people can follow me on Instagram at Jeffrey J Weissman on. Uh, what is it? Twitter at Jeff, J E F with one F, Weissman, W E I S S M A N. Uh, at Jeffrey Weissman Actor on Facebook is my uh, fan page. Uh, I've got jeffreyweissman.com that you can actually email me from. And if someone wants a, an autographed picture from Pale Rider or Twilight Zone movie or Scarecrow Mrs. King or, oh, I'm, I have some now as Screech's Guru from Saved by the Bell, um, the High Geek. And then, of course, back to the future. So, you know, for the fans in your life, or if you're a fan you and go. you want to sign of pictures, sure. uh, just of write, write. Always a fan. That's why I'm looking forward to inviting you to have dinner with us, and hopefully Donald will be yeah, here and, jo and Johnny will be there. And I got to thank you so much for ca uh, for calling in. And a special shout-out. Uh, I know he, he didn't ask me to do it because I haven't spoke to him, but Lavari, our friend Lavari. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we love him. Yeah, he's uh... – He's quite a marketer. He is Lavari. Yeah, um, yep. uh, had a great, uh, great little soiree with him in in uh, at the Horicon in New Jersey. That was fun. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, boy, that was that was a great show. Ryan Scott Weber put on. You guys got to make it next time. Yes, we're uh, gonna be there. Not, we're gonna be not there. just we, the firemen. Yeah, we no, we definitely we used to do a lot of uh, uh, Scott Weber's play, uh, uh, Ryan's uh, things, and then COVID came, but we're back. We're going to see all you guys uh, in person and uh, just wear that shirt because then when it fades away, we got another one for you. That's all I got to say. <laughs> Love it. Thank Love it. So and thank you, Ned. Thank you, Ned, for uh, using your phone. And here. I'll see you in the future. Thank you yes, so much. Sir. Jeffrey Weissman, God bless you. Thank you so much. And don't forget to you let know, us guys. know when you're in town. Yes, and, and, and God rest Ray Liotta. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Yes. absolutely. All right. All right, guys. All right. All right. George McFly. All right. So.